All right, so um, my name is Jessica Downs. I'm the children's pastor at East Ridge Church in Issaquah, and we've got a nice little um, intimate group here, so I'm just gonna be relaxed and we can have conversation about it. If you have any questions at any point, feel free to just interrupt and or raise your, maybe raise your hand, you know, things like that. But um, so a couple questions for you. When you think of being a children's pastor, what do you think of? What are our roles as a children's pastor? What do you think? Um, teach kids. Teach kids. That's a good one. This, I, have, I have a leash. There we go. Okay. So teach kids. What else? Lead volunteers. Lead volunteers. Um, show uh, non-conditional love. Mm, unconditional love. Those are great. Um, to me, like be an example. Yeah, be an example. To kids and volunteers. Be an example to kids and volunteers, yeah. And I'm finding more because it's down to just my lead pastor and myself on our leadership team <laughs> right now. Um, like I'm influencing the direction of our church, which. Yeah. I have horrible handwriting, kind of being lazy about it, sorry. Well, that kind of... Preparation, preparing. Prepa yeah. What was the first part of what you said? Preparation, preparing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> preparing. <laughs> yeah. Life. Preparing kids for life, yeah. yeah that's oh, I see. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. That's okay. We're talking about roles, our role as kids pastors. What does that look like? We got teeth. Yeah. And just so you know, guys, there is there is a handout on that little table right there. We're good. We're good. Oh, we're growing. Look at this, these fashionably late people. <laughs> Just kidding. So these are all great things. These are all things that we do as kids pastors. But one thing that is, and, and you, kind of, you kind of touched on it with the fact that we have the opportunity to influence the direction of the church, but one of our key roles as children's pastors is to support our pastor. And, and what does that look like? As, as children's pastors, we are there to lead the kids, to lead the volunteers, but at the same time, we are in a place of second chair leadership. We are there first and foremost, yes, to serve God's kingdom, but also to serve the vision of the, our pastor. And what does that look like for you? So that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I have the opportunity to help write a chapter in the Fusion book about this. And uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is um, leading from the middle. How do we do that successfully? As uh, someone who is born with leadership abilities and, and have found ourselves in those situations, how do we lead while still being a good follower of our pastor? So uh, we're gonna touch on three different things. Um, and if you're like me, I like to like fill in ahead of time, so I'm not gonna let you do that. <laughs> I'm gonna give them to you one by one. I was gonna line it out, but you know. Um, so. Today, you know what? I should probably grab one of those. <laughs> Thanks. Just so I'm making sure I'm filling in all the, the blanks. Um, the first thing is to be present. Number one, be present. Now, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. We can probably all figure out why it's important to, to be a, support of our, a supporter to our pastor, right? I mean, number one, we want to keep our jobs, right? We want to support our pastor because, hello, they sign our paychecks, but it, it goes so much deeper than that. When our pastor feels supported and when he feels loved and encouraged, he is going to be a better pastor. He's gonna be a better leader. He's gonna be a better boss. So number one, again, be present. So it's easy to say be present, but it's not always easy to do, right? So many times we get caught up with, well, this is what I did at my last church, or I wish, um, I don't know, Ryland's in a really cool position at his church, and, and we are, 
we get caught up with wanting something that we don't have, whether it's something that we had in the past or something that we thought we would have at this point in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, so be present, be fully engaged where you are because you're never going to reach your potential, the potential that God has given you where you are, if you're constantly focused on the past or on the future. So I wanna encourage you guys that, that we have to, to be present. Um, we have to find contentment where we are. And there's, there's a quote about contentment that I thought was, that was really good. Um, and number one, com comparison is the thief of joy, right? Uh, the, the Roosevelt said that, some people said it was Teddy, some people said it was Eleanor, but comparison is the thief of joy. But also contentment is not the fulfillment of what you, ha what you want, rather. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, but the realization of how much you already have. So contentment is not, it shouldn't be circumstantial. It shouldn't be based on what you have or what you don't have. It should be based on who you are, right? We are children of the king. We're sons and we're daughters of the king. Just like um, Al was talking about last night of finding our identity and, and who we are and whose we are. Our job is only a part of, of, it's not even who we are. It's what we do, right? God has called us to it. And so in that sense, he has created us for that. But we are not first and foremost children's pastors. We are children of the king. We are followers of God. So find, finding contentment is not, um, it shouldn't be based on our circumstances. I mean, think about Adam and Eve, the beginning of the world, Genesis. You've got people who were put into paradise. Nothing could have been better. And yet they still found that they were wanting more. They were wanting bigger. They were wanting better. They, ha they wanted what they could not have. The one single thing that they could not have in the entire place, that's what they wanted. So we all know that like the, the phrase, the grass is always greener on the other side. We all know that that's not true, right? It's, it's, and it's never true. But yet in ministry, sometimes we think that of, um, you know, Dave's pastor is more hands off or um, whatever the situation may be. You may look at another church, you may look at another position or another person and say, man, I wish I was in their situation. I wish I was at their church because this would be so much easier. But it's never greener on the other side. Every church has its challenges because hello, we're people. We are imperfect and the people that we work with are imperfect. So there's always going to be challenges. For me, uh, at a, I came from a smaller church and it was like, oh, man, if I had a larger church, there's just a bigger pool of people to find volunteers from. But then you're at a bigger church, you've got more holes to fill, right? And it, it's not easier. It's not, it's, it's, it's just a different challenge. Um, so find contentment where you are because you won't be able to to fulfill your potential, fill, fulfill what God is wanted, wanting you to do if you don't, if you don't find that contentment in, in who you are, not what you do. Um, the, the verses here, Zechariah 4.10, don't, desp don't despise the day of small beginnings. You know, uh, one of the things is you're like, man, I'm however old you may be, I'm 35 and I just thought that I was going to be in a different place. I thought I was going to be at a bigger church or I thought I was going to be, you know, speaking to the masses or I thought I would have written a book by now. Um, don't despise the day of small beginnings because following up Luke 16, 10, whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. Be faithful with, with what you've been given because then God will, will trust you <laughs> to give you more. If we can't be faithful with what, with what we've been given, we can't expect him to give us more. It goes, it goes the same way, I read this, this is sidetrack, but with volunteers, right? We want more volunteers, but are we being truly uh, a good steward of the volunteers we have? Yeah. So, oh, side note, doesn't have to do with leading from the middle, but you know. Um, the, the second uh, fill in the blank here, learn from the past, but don't live there. It's important to look back at our previous positions or um, Jim Weidman says, you know, uh, experience is the best teacher, but it doesn't have to be your experience. You can learn from other people's mistakes and their experiences too. Um, learn from the past, whether it's your past or someone else's past, learn from it, but don't live there. If you're, you've, you've probably all heard the, the metaphor of looking in the rear view mirror, right, when you're driving. It's good to know where you've come, but you get in a car wreck if you're not looking forward. 
I don't know. <laughs> it's important to not fully focus, not focus so much on what was behind that you miss what's in front of you and, and, and what's uh, really, yeah, it, right in front of you, the present. So don't, so learn from the past, but don't live there. And then the comparison, you know, uh, social media has made it really easy for us to connect with people and that's awesome on a, tons of levels. But at the same time, we are, um, at least for me personally, I'm finding myself comparing myself to other people more because I have greater access to what they're doing, right? Oh, that, that event looks super, super cool. I wish I could do that. I wish I was a better leader. I wish I was a stronger visionary. I wish I was a, a better communicator. I wish I was this. I wish I was that. But God has created you who you are for a reason. That doesn't give us a pass on self-improvement, right? We should always be learning. We should always be growing. Great leaders are never done growing. But we have to recognize that God has placed within us certain strengths that he hasn't placed in the person that you're comparing yourself with, right? You're different. You're different leaders. You, you bring different strengths to the table. So be careful that you don't play the comparison game. Number two, the second one is be a student. Be a student. Um, in order to fully support your pastor, you have to know what supporting him looks like to him. What matters to him? Does punctuality matter? Does, um, I don't know, what are some other things? What matters to your pastors? Being encouraged. Being encouraged. Being encouraged as the pastor, like you encouraging him? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Groups. groups. Life groups, small groups. No Say that again? So we, we got a new one. So new one. Not sure yet. Hey, <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. We're, we're still learning each other, so. But he's huh? awesome. Does he want you to wear a suit? Yeah, does he want you to wear a suit? I mean, you could. simple things. Yeah. Th those are things that aren't always lined up in the new hire packet, right? <laughs> There's probably some other ones, you know, in Texas. No, I'm just no um, find out what matters to your pastor because you can be supporting him, quote unquote, supporting him in a lot of ways, but if it's not how he understands support, then it's not, you're not doing it right, to be frank right? You're, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it well if it doesn't speak support to him. So find out what makes him tick. Find out what's important to him. If, it, if it's, you know, showing up in a suit, then show up in a suit. If it's to be punctual, I mean, you could support your pastor. You could post things on Facebook. You could rave to your community, to your friends about how awesome your pastor is, but you show up 15 minutes late to your appointment with him. He doesn't feel supported if punctuality is the biggest thing to him, right? Or a big thing. I mean, let's be honest. Show up on time to your appointments with your pastor. I mean, that's, that, should just, that should just be a rule. But, yeah, what does he value? Number, and then the, the second thing, what does he expect from you? You know what I mean? What does that, what does that look like to him? And one of the things, I, I just got to do an internship with Jim Weidman, and, and he encouraged us to ask, my, ask our pastors, what does a good children's pastor look like to you? Simple question. I sent it to my pastor. He gave me a full page of this is what it looks like. And you won't know unless you ask sometimes. Sometimes it'll be lined out, right? But sometimes it's not. Sometimes those things that don't end up in the new hire packet would end up on that sheet of saying, um, you know, connecting with parents and this and that. And this is what a good children's pastor looks like to me. So especially for you, Emery, in your situation, you're, you have a new pastor. So going to him and saying, or going to her, I don't know, male, yeah. female, uh, and saying, what does a good children's pastor look like? Or what does a good children's volunteer look like? And, and being able to, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt of being able to go back to that and say, okay, am I doing these things? Because to my pastor, this is what a good children's pastor is like. One of the really cool things that I got to do um, was introduced to through Infuse, through the mentorship program with Jim Weidman, was a thing called the PEP test. Path Elements Profile, and we've probably all done disc profiles and different things like that. It's similar, same thing. But this one was a lot easier for me to remember. Yeah. Sorry, who's Jim Weidman? Jim Weidman is, yeah, so he's kind of a children's ministry guru. Um, he's written 10, 10 books or so. Um, children's ministry volunteers that stick, um, tweetable leadership, stretch, Eric Trapp, a bunch of different things. But he's a great, great resource. He also has um, like a podcast but they're in a CD form, which is kind of nice when you're driving. I don't like to, I guess you could just download it on your phone, but I haven't. Um, but it's called Think 7, 
and it's seven different major topics of recruiting like Jesus and um, second chair, the same idea, second chair leadership and different things like that. That's a great, um, a great resource is uh, Think Seven and all of his different books. But the PEP test, PEP is Path Elements Profile. So same idea as DISC, but it's a little, it's easier for me to understand because I don't remember what my, you know, E, I, J, R, Q, I don't, I don't remember it. This is, it's based on the four elements, which if you're, you know, if you like rock bands, I don't even know if they're a rock band. Fire, earth, water, wind, right? <laughs> what is it? Earth, wind, wa water, fire. Oh, earth, wind, and fire. So water wasn't even in there, right? See, we got, we got a 90s, you're 90s, right? 90s kid who knows what I, I don't know. So anyhow, a, a quick snippet of what those people are like. So the water, I am a water. <laughs> so water is, uh, no, excuse me, I'm not a water, I'm an earth. A water is sensitive to other people's needs. I, I'm, I try to be sensitive to other people's needs. They go with the flow. They're very relational. I know, water, I know. That's the nice part is that it kind of just makes sense. Water, go with the flow. They, um, they're very relational. So they're, they don't want to be confrontational. Right? So if you've got a pastor who is a water, he's a great shepherd, but he might have a challenge bringing correction, right? Or maybe you're a water and you recognize that in yourself. Um, water is, they're typically slower movers. They might, when it comes to a change, they might be okay with change, but it might take them a little bit to grasp it and to, to actually implement it. And they are good at maintaining. An earth, which is what I am, an earth is driven by orderly tasks. We are reliable. We thrive on details. We like to stay focused on one task to get it done well. Um, and we also tend to be slow movers. Not always super relational. You know, we're stable. Earth, stable. Then there's wind. Wind is, um, a lot of children's pastors are probably winds. They're like, yeah, this is awesome. Let's do this, let's do that. Very idea driven. Um, not detail-oriented whatsoever. So for, for wins, you have to have an administrator is vital to, your, to the health of your children's ministry, right? Is a hurricane an option? Hurricane. So you are probably very much a wind, and you can be a wind water, or you could be, you know, you could be a mix of things. That is also called fusion, That's which, fusion, which is funny, but a mixture of everything. So uh, wind, they're dreamers. They're very relational. They like looking at the big picture, doesn't want the details, prefers a fast and changing pace. They like to initiate things. Um, they can be restless. They, they want change. So if things have been the same for a while, they might just want to switch it up just because, because there's new things. We got we to gotta keep going. We got to keep moving, keep shaking. Fire. Fire is a visionary. They are also, like Earth, they're driven by tasks. They uh, tend to seek power or control to achieve the goals. So they, they're, uh, when you think of a leader, kind of take charge mentality, fire is pretty much that. They move quickly and they enjoy initiating tasks. So they enjoy initiating tasks. Um, they don't want to like get bogged down by the details, but they want to know the details. They want to know that you are doing the details. So if your pastor is a fire, uh, one thing that fire is not, they are not relational. They're just not very relational. So something to, uh, if your pastor is a fire, you don't want to say things like, I'm just really feeling overwhelmed right now. I've just got a lot on my plate. If you have these feelings, they don't like feelings. Not that they don't have feelings, right? But they don't want, they're not driven by feelings. They're driven by tasks. And so for you saying, I feel overwhelmed, they're like, well, give it to someone, to, someone else to get done, right? They just want to make sure that it gets done. And uh, they, now that's not probably not true for every fire, but generally speaking, a fire is someone who um, just wants to make sure that it gets done and they don't really want to get emotions mixed into there. It's your job, right? It's your job, so get it done. Whether that means you do it or someone else does it. Now, if you've got a person who is an earth, you're gonna have to update them on all the different, all the different details that are happening to make sure that they know that things are getting done in an orderly process right? If you have a pastor who's a wind, they don't care about the details. They want it to happen. They want it to be big. They want it to be awesome. They want people to have fun. They want people to be, to, to, to have relationship, but they don't, they don't care about how it gets done as long as it gets done. So kind of a hands off. And then if you've got a person who's a, a, a water, they want to know that you're doing good. 
They want to know that you're doing okay as a person, as a leader, that you are emotionally healthy. They want to make sure that the people that you're leading are emotionally healthy, that the kids are doing well. Um, very much, very much driven by that relational aspect. So. You have to, as children's pastors, we have to learn what our pastor's language is. Because for me, um, my pastor is a little bit more of on the fire side. So I have to be careful as I'm, I'm an earth, so I don't, I'm not necessarily the emotional side, but I'm also a woman. So hello, we've got, we talk about emotions more. So I have to be careful to kind of turn that off, turn off the emotional side of things and say, Okay, you want to add things to my plate. That's fine. We can do that. We can make this happen. If this happens, I will have to take something else off my plate. So um, you just have to speak as a, well, even saying I isn't always a good thing. Talking about we. Yeah, we can do that. But something's going to have to, something will have to move. And that's cool. We can totally do that. Always be on in favor of it. A fire doesn't want to be, um, doesn't want to be challenged in front of other people. So if you, if you have someone, even on your team, if you're a fire, you might recognize this too, of I'm cool taking correction, but don't do it in front of other people. So when, when you do have to bring correction to one of your volunteers, if they're a fire, you have to do it in private. Do it to the side and say, hey, I'm, I'm kind of seeing this. Um, this, pet prof, this pep test is uh, super, super helpful in dealing with anyone, in dealing with your spouse. So you can have your spouse do it, and you're like, oh, oh that makes a lot of sense. And I've got... I've got mine, and you're welcome to come see it after, after class here, after the workshop, um, of there are strengths and challenges for each one, this, the lab, or whatever we're not supposed to call it, yeah, um, strengths and challenges. And one thing that was super cool, um, side note, that, that I was taught, wow, this microphone is way down there, hello, there we go, that I was taught is that um, when you are walking in the spirit, these are your strengths. When you start seeing these challenges, that means you're walking in, walking in the flesh, right? And so when you see yourself going into those, for me, it's a perfectionist tendency. When I see myself going over into that perfectionist uh, side, I have to pull myself back and say, okay, this is not of God. Perfectionism is not, you know, that's not a, a godly trait. We can never achieve perfectionism. So um, going back into the, the spirit, spirit-led side. So anyhow, um, that was cool to me. I thought it was a really cool resource. The last, I want to make sure that I'm filling out the, yeah, learn to speak his language. Because if you, like I said at the beginning, if you're, in, if you are supporting your pastor in a way that he doesn't understand being supported, um, then you're missing it, right? You're not doing it well. Uh, and it's kind of a harsh reality, but it's, it's true. You're not doing it well if he doesn't feel it. So um, you guys know the five love languages, right? Same thing with your pastor. Now, physical touch, you got to be careful with that one, right? But knowing how, knowing how to speak his language, um, when you're married, speaking your wife's language, right? Spe- speaking your husband's la- language of you might, you might be showering your husband or your wife with gifts, but if that's not how she's receiving love, then that's just a bunch of money she's spent, right? It's the same, same kind of concept with your pastor. So um, the last item here is to be an encourager. One of the best encouragers we see in the Bible is a man named Barnabas. And Barnabas was a leader and um, Paul came along and he, Barnabas actually took a back step or took a back seat to Paul and let him shine, let him do uh, what God created him to do. And you see more and more as, uh, as it goes on, you see Barnabas taking this back seat and being okay with it and encouraging Paul and, and letting him know that he, he's doing a great job and he, you know, just letting him, letting him go and letting him sail with what God has placed in his life. And for us, we have to do the same thing to our pastor. Encouragement is a basic human need. We all know that ministry, is ministry easy? No. 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 It took a little longer than, than I thought it would. Ministry is not easy. Ministry is hard. If we need encouragement, we also have to know that our pastor needs encouragement. He's, he or she is a human being, and they need encouragement. So it is up to us as a staff person to provide that encouragement. We all have days where we um, have an off Sunday, right? And like, like Rebecca was talking about, no one came, or I totally messed that up, I wish I would have done this. And 
your pastor has the same days. He has those moments where he needs someone to come alongside and just encourage him. So what does that look like? What are some ideas of how to encourage your pastor? Tell a testimony. Testimony, yeah, that's great. Tell a testimony. Reinforce the idea that you're supporting the church as a whole. Yeah, reinforce the idea you're supporting the church for as a whole. Yeah, I like that. Uh, what, does that what does that even look like? It's like, For us and what we're trying to like initiate is is that it's not uh, kids is over here, mm-hmm. and youth is over here, and the traditions is over here. But what we're where the church is, has been a part is yeah. like mirroring mirroring what they value, what the church values in if in both kids service and mm-hmm. adult service. Yeah, mirroring. Because Sorry, I have to say it for the microphone again. Keep keep saying what you're gonna say. Uh, because ultimately, it was the senior pastor. Did I say mirror? Mirror. Did I say mirror? I meant microphone. <laughs> Struggling. Um, ultimately, it was a senior pastor who initiated right. um, all the changes or, or whatever it may be, um, but the way that we do church. Um, uh, and so for me to support it and mirror what he's doing yeah. in big service on, on a children's basis or even for the youth pastor to do the same, um, yeah. it shows your support because you're on board for what he's doing. Yeah, that's big. Mirroring the vision of the church into the kids' ministry and saying, I support your vision because that's what we're here for. We're here to support our pastor's vision. God has put our pastor where he has put him for such a time as this. And that means that we as children's pastors need to come under his leadership and serve that vision. So for me, and and like you're saying, we changed our kids' ministry vision to be the same vision as the church. Outreach embrace disciple because that's the vision of the church. So what does that look like for kids ministry? And then you go from there. But like you said, mirroring that in the youth and the kids, uh, the same vision that he has for the church as a whole, making sure that we, um, that we have that in ours too. That's good. How else can we encourage our pastors? How about cards? Write them a note. Right? Write them a note. How much? I like getting mail. Handwritten cards. Hello. Put jokes on them. Play jokes on him. Hey, if your pastor is a jokester, you do those pranks, man. If he's not, as we're speaking, your pastor's language is important. (laughs) If he's not a jokester, that would would go well. Not go well. How about remembering his birthday? Remembering his anniversary? Inviting him over for dinner? Whatever you think encouragement looks like to you, how do you want to be encouraged? It doesn't hurt to do that for your pastor, right? Again, it's important to speak his language, but I mean, for the most part, if you're just looking to encourage someone, encouragement is universal. <laughs> what, is, what does that look like for you? Do that for your pastor. And one other thing is, um, and this isn't always easy, but respect your pastor's decisions. Because ultimately it's, it's his, ultimately it's God's church, right? But it's his church. God has given him that church. So respect his decisions. Now, when it comes to fundamental beliefs, if you're on a different page, then you might want to look at going somewhere else. But uh, if he has made a decision for the church as a whole, come under that decision. Be the same in the office as you are in public. He needs to know that you've got his back. Social media, be careful what you post. Um, So in, in conclusion, be present, be a student, be an encourager. Your pastor has chosen you. Whether he hired you on or whether he kept you on after a transition, doesn't really matter. You are where you are for a reason. He believes or she believes that you can do the job that you have been asked to do. Sometimes it, sometimes it doesn't always feel like that, right? But um, again, Jim Weidman, I'm, right, I'm sorry, I just spent six months with him. Jim Weidman talks about how... Um, There's no one on earth other than your mother that wants to see you succeed more in your ministry than your pastor. So even in those moments where you feel, feel just the pushback and you feel like, okay, is, does he believe in me? Just know that the fact that you are still there, the fact that you have the position that you are in goes to show that he believes in you, goes to show that um, you are where he wants you to be. So take any, um, Take anything that that is said (laughs) with a grain of salt, knowing that he wants to see you succeed. Because your success means the ministry of the the church is a success. 
So Mark 3, I'll, I'll finish with this. Mark 3.25 says, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So in your church, with your senior pastor, even if there is um, a butting of heads, even if there is a personality difference of I'm water, he's wind, or whatever that might look like for you, just know that you ha- there has to be unity or else the church cannot succeed. No matter what you do, whatever, no matter what you put your hand to, um, now God, God can do anything, right? But as the church as a whole, it's not going to succeed if, if there's division there. So um, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to turn off the microphone, and we're just going to chat for a little bit. What are, what's your situation? Uh, how can we pray for each other? Are you, are you in a season where you're having disagreements with your pastor? Um, and I'm going to turn off the microphone so that we can have an honest conversation with each other. So, sound good?